good afternoon, everybody. It's about one o'clock and we're going to get started. I'm Susanna Reese with Stop Pests and Housing. Stop Pests is funded by an interagency agreement between the USDA's National Institute of Food and Agriculture and HUD's Office of Healthy Homes and Lead Hazard Control. We provide training and technical assistance to affordable housing providers on integrated pest management. If you work at a housing site that is in need of on-site assistance and training, uh, let me know. Get in touch with Stop Pests through our website or by the email address we'll show you at the end. We're located at Cornell University's Northeastern IPM Center, and that's not to be confused with the New York State IPM program where, our, where today's presenter is from. It's my honor to have Dr. Matt Fry join us today for developing a pest exclusion program for cockroaches and rodents. Matt's a community IPM extension educator with the New York State IPM program. His work focuses on helping people prevent issues with pests in buildings and around their homes. He provides management recommendations on rodents, bed bugs, cockroaches, ticks, flies, and many, many more pests. He has a PhD in entomology from the University of Delaware, but it appears to me his career has definitely veered down the path of rodentologist in his uh, latest research and work in urban pest management. One of his more memorable projects that I'm interested in is Matt was involved with a survey of pathogens and ectoparasites in rodents in New York City in collaboration with Cornell and Columbia universities. So that means he trapped rodents, live rodents, in Manhattan, New York, and identified species of ectoparasites that they carried. As interesting as that sounds, Matt is here to talk today about a different topic uh, that will actually prevent the exposure um, to some of those pathogens, pest exclusion. It's a vital element of pest control, which is often overlooked. Um, Matt is also a member of SCOPE, the Scientific Coalition on Pest Exclusion. I'm sure he's going to share a little bit about his work there as well. We have a link to that website, to the SCOPE website at the end of this presentation. I encourage everyone to find out more about pest exclusion through the work of SCOPE. Today, we'll hear about some of his recommendations that have evolved from that work with SCOPE and from his experience, his vast experience in managing urban pests. Before I turn things over to Matt so he can share his presentations, I want to encourage everybody to use the chat box or the Q&A. You should be able to find those in your, in your control panel um, and ask us questions. Your microphones are muted, so I will read those questions to Matt at the end of the presentation. But you can also email us with further questions after the webinar. You can reach me at stoppest at stoppest at cornell.edu, and Matt's email address is mjf. 267 at cornell.edu and we'll have those up on the at the end of the presentation. Also on the website that you see on the on your screen, the stoppest.org slash go slash exclusion, you'll find a PDF of the presentation, some resources, and a certificate of completion if you would like to uh, print that off and fill that out. You can also find, you will also find the recording of this presentation on that same page. So you can rewatch it or feel free to share it with your colleagues. I have one last announcement. Uh, we have another webinar coming up on November 14th called Integrated Pest Management, a simple solution to problem pests in elderly and disabled public housing. The presenters for that webinar are Dawn Gouge, Lucy Lee, and Shaku Nair from Arizona Pest Management Center, and they're going to be presenting some of their actual data on how they were able to reduce pest numbers and infestation levels through um, implementing an IPM program. At this point, I'm going to turn the controls over to Matt, so bear with us as we switch presenters, and about five minutes into the presentation, we're going to ask that you help us out with answering some poll questions. They should appear on your screen. Some people had technical difficulties last time I did this and they were generally people who were viewing from an iPad. Um, so the if you don't see the polls come up, I'm not sure there's much you can do except try to play around with the Zoom controls on your iPad or your device. But if they you don't see the polls, we will talk through them and announce the results to you as, as, as they come up. One more slide, just for those that maybe are tuned in and are not getting any sound. I, um, they can't hear me right now, but hopefully this slide helps them figure out where the controls for their sound is. So at this point, I'm going to stop sharing and Matt, Matt is going to pull up his presentation and you can bear with us for a moment as he switches over.
Okay, are we all set, Susanna? Yep, we can hear you and we can see the screen, perfect. Terrific. Well, thank you for that wonderful introduction um, and thank you especially to Stop Pest Program for all the work that you've done. Um, just hearing about these webinars that have been offered. Um, I attended Rick's webinar on bed bugs, which was fantastic and I look forward to the upcoming webinar. Um, today, we are going to be talking exclusion. And I'd like to start off with one of the most important reasons to consider pest exclusion. And that is human health. So our presentation today will definitely highlight exclusion of rodents. As Susanna said, even though I'm an entomologist, rodents have really become my passion and interest as it relates to pest management. And throughout history, rodents have brought pathogens of many varieties literally to our tables. Um, for instance, just last year, rodent-borne disease took the life of one New Yorker uh, in the case of le leptospirosis, um, highlighted here on the left. And that also made several others sick in a multifamily housing unit. Because of the role that rodents play in human health, uh, actually this month, Pest Control Technology Magazine featured articles on public health um, in their annual rodent control issue. Um, this includes a terrific article by Dr. Bobby Corrigan on the public health importance of urban rodents and specifically the disease potential of New York City mice. Um, so PCT Magazine is freely available. You can download the issue and read some really great articles about the uh, urban problems that we face with rats and mice um, contributing to human disease. Our presentation today will also explore another pest group that significantly affects human health, cockroaches. Uh, while these pests are known to carry numerous pathogens on and inside their bodies, uh, they're also a source of allergens. In fact, one fecal spot, and you see many in this picture, each of those little black flecks, um, one fleck of that poop is enough to sensitize and sustain an allergic reaction in people. So while our current uh, pest management practices attempt to reduce our encounters with cockroaches, rodents, and other pests by killing them um, once they are inside, these efforts really lack the prevention that we need to avoid entirely negative consequences of pests. And if we want to protect public health, uh, my suggestion is that we need to prevent encounters by keeping pests outside of places where people live, work, learn, and play. So essentially, our focus on exclusion is not anything new. This image that you see here comes from a 1939 textbook written by Hugo Hartnack, um, where he emphasized the importance of exclusion. But today, we still see that exclusion is not highly adopted. And we're requesting a paradigm shift, uh, both for individuals that own and manage buildings, as well as the pest management industry, to really highlight the role of exclusion in pest prevention. What we see when we look at the industry in general is that exclusion is widely recognized. In all of the textbooks that we have today, Malice Handbook, Truman's Guide, exclusion and sanitation are always highlighted and mentioned. But looking at the industry and the pract practitioners of pest, uh, pest management, we see that practices for pest exclusion are not standardized. Um, there are resources that are available, but they're often not promoted. Um, and so the goal of our presentation today is to really make uh, adoption of exclusion less daunting. We wanna provide specific recommendations that even someone without any training can do to help limit uh, the entry of pests into buildings. So today's presentation is going to basically follow this format. We're gonna talk about inspection, prioritization, uh, tools and materials, implementation, and then how we can evaluate these programs.
Um, as I said, I'm going to step through these different procedures that are part of a uh, pest exclusion program. And you'll see that the majority of uh, this presentation focuses on inspection. And the reason is that any time we're dealing with a pest problem, our inspection informs us on where the pests are living, uh, what are the resources that they're using, and how we can best manage them. All of this information is acquired during the inspection. So we're gonna actually dive pretty deeply into inspection more than just the obvious uh, that you might learn in a standard pest management course. Of course, I have to show a tool slide. As someone that conducts inspections for commercial kitchens and other settings to identify pest problems, all of these tools and a few more are on my utility belt. And um, starting at the top left, of course, a, a mirror is helpful for those hard to reach angles. Um, can shine light off of that to help see in dark corners and other places. The tool immediately below that on the left with the sort of hooked edge, um, that is really useful for inspecting drains. Um, it's a cotter pin removal remover, but um, you can stick that hooked end into a floor drain to pull up the grate and inspect. Oftentimes, we just look directly into the drain and we see that maybe there's some accumulation, but when you pull off that drain cap itself, you can often see a lot more debris settled around the drain cap, so it's a really useful tool. Um, spatulas for inspecting, but the, the one that I'll really highlight here is on the bottom right, and that is um, a ruler with the ability to measure the actual opening size for openings of what pests can enter. And you'll see throughout this presentation that we're really interested in what size opening is present and what pests can enter. So for our inspection, I will say that there is valuable information in every single kill that is made by a pest professional or someone monitoring for pests. Oftentimes um, in a pest management program, someone will walk into the room, remove a dead rodent, dead cockroaches, and just say, uh, that there was evidence of a pest in a particular unit or trap. But there is extremely valuable information that's going to inform your management plan in each and every kill. First of all, um, identification. If we know the particular species that we're dealing with, whether it's a roof rat, a Norway rat, or a mouse, and which species of mouse, it can tell us information about its nest site, um, seasonal activity, when it's more likely to be a problem in our facility, its capacity to reproduce, how many offspring can we expect from that particular organism? What are its food sources? What does it prefer to feed on? How far does it forage to food sources? All of this information we can learn just by documenting what species is present. And I would say that in most cases, if I look at a monitoring log and there's a mouse problem, it simply says mice. It doesn't differentiate between the different species. So I'll have you look at some pictures here. Um, hopefully this isn't too graphic for, for most audiences, um, but here's a, a glue board that has three critters on it. And obviously I can't ask you to respond, but think about which pest this is. Hopefully, some of you can guess that this is actually Norway rats. Um, even though they look small in size, um, the thick tail that you see is evidence that it is nor juvenile Norway rats, as well as those large hind feet in the one on the right. Um, this was taken from a public housing unit, and um, the one thing that I really do not like about this, um, you know, people have their perspective, perspectives on glue boards, but the use of a rodenticide bait on a glue board um, is not something I would recommend. The rodents in most cases are not going onto a glue board for a food source, um, and certainly a rodenticide cannot be placed outside of a protected container. So um, just needed to point that out for this particular picture. All right, here's another critter. Hopefully you can take a guess at this one. These are house mice, um, large ears you can see here, um, skinnier tail compared to the last one. And if you were to flip these guys over, you would see that there's a uniformity in the color between the fur on their back coat and their belly. So that's gonna tell us that that is house mice. 
accurate identification is the foundation of effective pest management. So here we have two different situations. Obviously, there are a ton of mice in both of them. Um, one is the house mouse, and one is what I would group as a field mouse, uh, either the deer mouse or the white-footed mouse. And the way that we differentiate the two is, as I just said, uh, uniformity in color is the house mouse. So the one on the left is house mice. They can be gray or they can be brown, but the characteristic of uniformity in color is what differentiates them. On the right, um, about the middle of the picture, you could see that one of these mice has a very white belly, um, bottom left as well. And so these are going to be our field mice. Now, why does this matter? Our target pest influences our plan. Which of these mice is a permanent resident in buildings? The house mouse. Which mouse is seasonal? Our white-footed or deer mouse, which I collectively call field mice, and which one is found in urban areas? Actually, both of them. Um, White-footed mice can be found in urban areas, including New York City. And we're gonna talk more about what this means for our plan in just a moment. So we have our two mice. Uh, on the left is our white-footed mouse. On the right is our deer mouse. If we're dealing with uh, white-footed mice, what is our exclusion priority? Knowing that these animals spend most of their time outdoors and that they only come in or most often come in in the fall and winter time for shelter, we really want to focus our exclusion efforts on the exterior. We wanna make sure that there's no avenue for these animals to enter our facilities or, or homes. In the case of house mice, we know that these critters, once they get into a building, tend to establish themselves near a food source. That may be a compactor, that may be someone's kitchen. So when we're dealing with house mice, we're most concerned with interior connections between floors and rooms. We wanna make sure that these mice aren't able to spread throughout a building using the connectivity between walls. We'll talk a little bit about identification as well. So knowing what sex we have and what sex we're catching can influence how much effort we put into our plans. If we're continuously catching male mice, then we're unlikely to be reducing the population. We need to know if we're catching females because replacement quickly occurs in both mice and rat populations. Uh, you'll see highlighted in this table from Dr. Corrigan's um, chapter in Mal's handbook, that females can reach sexual maturity in about two months, one to two months for house mice and about three months for rats. In many cases, uh, pest management services are offered on a uh, monthly or quarterly basis. And if that's the case, you can have complete replacement of a population within that duration. So we really need to make sure that we are capturing the females to reduce the population. I'm sure this isn't what you were thinking about on a Wednesday afternoon, but we are going to talk about rodent sex, and I'm going to ask you to learn how to identify them and differentiate them. Uh, the, different, the distance between the anus and the genitals is what's used to identify mice. Now, I am not asking you to grab them by the tail and look at these parts. Uh, you'll see in the next picture that it's very easy to identify them when, even when they're on a snap trap. Picture on the left is a male here referenced as a buck and has a greater distance between the genitals and the anus, whereas a doe, that distance is much shorter. So here are two pictures from the field um, taken right from a snap trap and you can see one has a very short distance and one has a longer distance. In the picture of the right, um, that greenish brown is actually uh, poop that you can see coming out of the anus. And that is tinted with green because that animal fed on um, a rodenticide bait. So short distance, female, longer distance, male. There you go. Now you have a life skill of being able to identify the sex of rodents. 
Now, as someone that wants to record this important information when dealing with a rodent problem, uh, we developed this rodent monitoring log that allows you to record all of this information. What type of rodent did you find? What species? How many were present? Was it a juvenile? Was it an adult? Was it a male? Was it a female? Um, and then some other things about the number of droppings, which may be an indicator of the population present. Uh, this form is available along with several of the others that we'll talk about today on the Scientific Coalition of Pest Exclusion website, uh, which Susanna indicated is on the announcement for this webinar. Okay, so the other main pest that we're dealing uh, using today as an example to develop a pest exclusion program are cockroaches. There are several cockroach species that can be present in buildings. Um, we'll start at the top left and hopefully you recognize some of these critters, but that is the German cockroach um, identified by those two uh, longitudinal bands on its uh, prothorax. Moving to the right, this one is a little bit less common, but is still present in and around buildings. Um, the oriental cockroach. In many cases, this one is most often found outdoors and on the exterior of buildings, but it can make its way inside. Bottom left are brown banded cockroaches. Um, these have brown bands uh, horizontally on the body. And then one of the most notorious cockroaches uh, from sewers and uh, basement areas is the American cockroach. Sometimes we don't find the cockroach itself, uh, but we may find it's evidence that they leave behind. And fortunately for cockroaches, they make it very easy for us to identify them. Um, these images are available from the Department of Entomology from the University of Nebraska, and it can help you to identify which cockroach you have based on the egg case that is present. So I'll just zip through this um, because many people may not have ever seen an egg case before. Um, but it is a useful tool in identification. Again, our target pest will influence our, our pest management plan. So which roach prefers to feed on food spillage? This is gonna be the one that we find in kitchens and other places where people eat. Hopefully you guessed it, the German cockroach. Which roach prefers pipes and drains? the American cockroach. And which one of those really does not care can be anywhere in a building, anywhere in a home? The brown banded, um, one of the more challenging cockroaches to manage because they're not tied to a specific food source or environment. So our inspection is really informative, as I mentioned, for determining our pest management plan. And in addition to being able to find pest evidence, we need to be able to interpret it. So this was a situation um, that I encountered in a multifamily housing. This was a basement um, and they found all of these droppings and were setting out mice traps, but were really frustrated as to not be catching any mice on the traps. Um, if you look closely at uh, the droppings in this image though, you'll notice that none of them have pointy ends. So this is actually droppings from American cockroaches. The other um, piece of evidence here that will tell you this is from American cockroaches are those longer um, and larger brown objects, which are the egg cases from American cockroaches. So interpretation is just as important as having a keen eye for inspection. We can also have some insights from the life stage of the organism that we catch. So not just um, male, female, not just species, but also the life stage. If we catch an adult male of the white-footed mouse inside, what is our focus? What is our emphasis? You might think exterior entry point. This is an animal that lives most of the year outdoors and enters to be indoors in the wintertime. So if we're finding them indoors, it's likely that they found an entrance. If we found a pup, we know that they are breeding indoors because juveniles tend to not move too far from the nest. So 
when we're conducting our inspection, if we find pups, uh, we want to really focus on identifying a nest in, indoors and nearby. The same is true of cockroaches. Cockroaches do not disperse far from breeding areas as juveniles. While you may find adults uh, dispersed far from the preferred habitat and breeding site, those juveniles will stay pretty close. And in this image, uh, we see mostly adult American cockroaches. There's one late instar nymph that could also travel pretty far, but we see a really immature stage of a German cockroach. And so it's likely that this glue board was near an area where uh, there's food spillage that would be suitable for German cockroaches and they're reproducing in that area. Our inspection is also the opportunity to find conducive conditions. Um, if you've worked in pest management at all, this has been hammered into your brains. We're looking for food, water, and harborage. We're looking for pest evidence, droppings, cast skin, pathways. Uh, we'll see with rodents that uh, they leave pathways behind for us to identify with their rub marks and with their droppings sometimes with uh, their footprints or tail drags, as you see on the bottom picture. Um, so we're looking for these tracks and pathways. Sometimes there's an odor associated with heavy infestations, and sometimes we see the critters themselves. So hopefully, um, I won't talk about all of these today, but hopefully you are aware of all the evidence and all the signs that pests leave behind. I do like to point out that it's really critical to not only conduct an inspection as a moment in time, but to also have monitoring equipment in place to have that record of time, to understand what's happened in the time that you were not present at night or on weekends when pests may be more active. Monitors can provide us with a ton of information about the pest population. Uh, this image alone on the right tells me that we're near a German cockroach breeding site because there are juveniles, that someone is aware of this population because they've been treated with an insect growth regulator that's affected the wings. So already I know that something is going on here and it helps me to better narrow down my efforts in managing a cockroach population. So I'll just point out that monitors don't have to be something fancy or expensive. Um, this case is dealing with mice and using snap traps as monitors. All devices can be considered monitors as long as we interpret the information accurately. So in this case, um, there was some rodent droppings that were found on top of this shelf in a basement. Uh, homeowner installed numerous types of traps um, in an attempt to catch what pest was present. Um, and I, I just want to point out some of the you know, key features of this attempt right here. So you'll see first um, in the foreground, there's a standard um, mouse snap trap that is not an expanded trigger, just a standard trigger that could be baited with a particular type of food. Um, on the sill plate behind it, you'll see a yellow and black uh, paddled traps, and they're about an inch to two inches apart. Um, this is a really great technique if you aren't using this in your rodent management plan to implement. Um, if a mouse is running along this sill plate and sees a trap, it might jump to avert the trap, but then subsequently land in a second trap. So this is um, a good technique to use uh, for mouse management. There's a trap in the corner, and then there's a trap all the way to the right, which is actually on a ledge by that windowsill. So when this uh, homeowner, and I will tell you that it was me in someone else's home, uh, found mice, they were first by the window, and then additional traps were installed uh, throughout this space in a systemic pattern, systematic pattern to try and identify where the problem was. And then catches were found um, further to the left. So this really, what this did is it helped me to focus my search into one specific area where pests might be coming from. 
this is a large basement. If I was to search this whole basement, it could take me hours and hours. And as a pest professional, there may not be enough time for me to do this thorough inspection. But if I come back and there's traps uh, with hits that are all surrounding this one point, it helps me focus that inspection. So pulling the insulation away, um, you know, this is an area that is adjacent on the exterior to a poured cement staircase. And it turns out that between the staircase and the foundation, uh, there's this one little gap that mice were coming through. So that trapping effort really helped me to monitor in my absence to find out where the pests were coming from. It was a record of events over a period of time and um, exploits the cryptic behavior of most pests. They're not present when I'm there inspecting, but they are out uh, when people are not home. So monitoring and record keeping can help with your management plan. Your inspection is an opportunity to identify structural issues. And this is a big one for today, our exclusion program. Um, deficiencies can offer pest harborage. You could see on the left here, uh, this is concrete hollow block and all that brown mark is smudge marks or sebum stains from mice going into and out of that concrete hollow block. Um, so that, that small deficiency provided enough harborage for a huge colony of mice. The image on the right, same situation, concrete hollow block, and here we have cockroaches harboring in that space. Uh, conducting inspections in commercial kitchens, I'll tell you there's a slew of opportunities for pests to develop. Um, these all highlight uh, exclusion opportunities for flies, which we will not be covering today. Um, but anytime there's this pooling of water, whether it's um, associated with a drain um, plumbing issue on the top left, a drainage issue on the top right, um, lack of exclusion materials bottom left under a grease trap, or in deficient tile um, settings where there's a lack of tile grout can allow for flies to breed in those areas. So the inspection helps to identify all of these opportunities. So what are we looking for specifically as it relates to pest exclusion? Well, unfortunately, cockroaches and as we indicated earlier, bed bugs, um, exclusion requires very small openings to be sealed for these pests. We know that cockroaches can enter openings as small as 1.6 millimeters. There is a preference for German cockroaches to harbor in openings that are a little bit bigger. This is based on uh, research by Dr. Kobe Shaw, and that opening would be about 4.8 millimeters. For rodents, uh, we know that opening size is based on the size of their skull. Uh, rodent bodies are flexible, but the rodent bones themselves are not. This is a common misconception we hear in the pest management industry that uh, rodents can collapse their skeletons or are made of cartilage and all these crazy things. Um, but we know that as long as a rodent can fit its head through an opening, it can manage to get its body through. So I have a, a two short videos that I'll show you. Um, there is sound on the first one, so just be ready to turn down your volume if it's too loud. Okay, and our second video, um, obviously that one was some um, mice that were reared from a colony and that maze was created to demonstrate that power, 
the power of food in motivating rodents to move through an environment to get to that food source. Um, this is the same maze in a garage setting with a natural um, environment, and this is a juvenile white-footed mouse that just slips its way right into this opening. Um, this was taken with one of the newer tools that's being used in rodent management, some of these um, infrared cameras, and you'll see that the rodent is aware that the camera is present. Just watch what um, watch in the opening after he goes through. So he kind of turns around and gives the camera the stink eye because he's aware that something made a noise when it turned on um, and he's just a little bit alarmed by what might what threat may be behind him. So for rats, um, obviously the openings are a little bit larger. Um, gaps, meaning the, the opening that is under a door um, has to be at least a half an inch to allow rats to get under. And if we're talking about a round opening, um, that would be about three quarters of an inch round. In pest prevention by design, which is an authoritative guideline for designing pests out of structures um, created by the San Francisco Department of the Environment, this has a listing of all the known um, pest entry sizes that are um, recorded from the literature um, for various different species. Now, I will point out that um, just because an insect has been measured to be a certain size with their thorax being a certain size, for example, it's possible that they can compress themselves smaller because insects, unlike rodents, do have that um, compressibility. So sometimes smaller mesh sizes may be needed um, in those instances. Okay, so something that we have also been advocating because we're trying to help people adopt exclusion is the use of an inspection form. Um, this was created along with the Scientific Coalition on Pest Exclusion to basically lay out all the steps that would be used in conducting an exterior inspection of a building to record where entry points are um, and hopefully have that be used to develop a management plan. Again, this is available on the SCOPE website. And what we're trying to identify with these forms is the largest permissible pest, because this will influence what materials we're going to use when we move to the implementation phase. If the opening is about the thickness of a business card or a metro card, an insect can pass through. If it's a round opening the size of a dime or a quarter, it could be a mouse or a rat, and anything larger, such as the size of a softball, in this case, um, could allow a raccoon or other wildlife to enter. During that inspection, you would use this form to identify the different pest sizes that are present, um, where the opening is, the type of material, and then some of the causes of the opening and what we would use to um, seal that opening. So again, this is available online. And how would this work? So this is an example of a distribution center um, that I inspected. And on the exterior, there was uh, near one door an opening. So you see I've circled in red where that opening was. Mark that as number one, which would be recorded on the sheet in the previous page. And then if possible, I would use a photo to document what the problem is and provide suggestions for how to remediate that problem. So all of that was inspection. And again, this is all going to help us gather the information we need to move through the rest of these steps. For prioritization, uh, we really need to assess which openings are critical for exclusion. Um, are, are we able to identify the primary entry points that rodent pests, for example, are using from the exterior. We're looking for areas that are close to food, water, and shelter, uh, for openings that are between units and floors, and possibly where pest evidence was found. Where prioritization um, comes into place is when there's an active infestation. The last thing that we want to do is seal 
a rat infestation, for example, into a home um, during a management plan. What this will likely do is cause them to create new openings, change their behaviors, and make management much more difficult. So we can combine inspections um, with visual inspections and the use of rodent monitoring equipment, such as the cameras, to identify which openings are um, non-preferred. So it, here we have um, three different colors of arrows. Um, this is just an example, but let's say that openings that are going from basement to attic are not really being used. So as we are conducting our rodent management plan, either with traps or baits, we want to seal those non-preferred openings. The same goes for the, um, the next level, the orange level, which may be used to some extent. Once we start to reduce the population, um, then we will seal those openings. And once the population has been eliminated and we are seeing no evidence of new rodents, um, then we are confident to exclude or seal that entry point from the exterior. If we seal it beforehand, um, as I said, it could complicate the rodent management efforts. Um, another form that I used to sort of prioritize which things need to happen first is this general inspection form. Uh, you'll see the column on the second column from the left is priority. Um, this allows you, if you're a pest professional or if you're dealing with building management and have to prioritize which um, openings to seal first because of financial limitations or other considerations, this is a way to communicate, this one is a high priority that needs to be sealed uh, first before some of these other um, openings need to be sealed. What I like about this form is that it also gives you the opportunity to identify other issues such as problems with the pest management plan um, or sanitation issues. And most importantly, it allows you to provide recommendations. So not just identifying the problem, but also providing specific recommendations for how to remediate that issue. This is just um, one example of a form that I actually used um, in a restaurant setting just to give you an idea of what it would look like. Um, but we may have different um, categories of problems that we identify that are a high priority. So here we had a exclusion priority. There was a large gap noted. Here's the recommendation. Um, other issues were related to the pest management practices that were in place. So again, um, a client or resident can say, okay, these six or five or six things are a high priority. Let me address them and then I'll move on to the next ones. Tool material and selection. Okay, there are many considerations when it comes to material selection. And I think that this has been one of the biggest obstacles in allowing people to adopt exclusion. Um, because of a lack of understanding of what materials to use, what will be effective and how to implement, um, I think a lot of people steer clear of exclusion um, when it is you know, a little bit easier than, than we make it out to be. So some of the considerations that we'll talk about are opening size, what pest can enter, the type of opening, the pest pressure for that environment, where, what specific um, environmental con conditions are present, the scope of service, expertise of employees, and aesthetics of work. Um, before we get too deep into um, the how, Here's some of the information that you may use to um, select different supplies needed for exclusion work. There's some great articles um, available from PCT Magazine, first by Scott McNeely on wildlife exclusion techniques. Um, this lists all of the supplies that he uses to perform wildlife exclusion. Similarly, an article by the uh, folks at Excluder, Tools of the Trade for Exclusion Services. Um, based on the poll, it seems that there is an interest in um, online materials, and so this course uh, from the National Wildlife Control Operators might be a great module for you to learn um, the different techniques and tools that are, are needed for pest exclusion. Okay, so environment and pest pressure. Um, 
when we talk about exclusion, there are definitely definitely some materials that are better than others. There are some that will stand up against rat pressure and others that will um, just exclude insects. And selecting which tools you want to use can uh, be based on the pest pressure in that particular environment. In other words, you may not need the most expensive materials to solve a pest problem um, depending on the environment. So here we have two different doors. Um, one is a suburban library front door, a lot of foot traffic, um, but not a lot of really interesting food items or harborage for cockroaches or rodents. So in this setting, we may not need the top of the line exclusion materials to keep pests out. Um, maybe we install a brush door sweep and monitor it regularly to make sure that no pests are coming through. Um, in this picture in particular, if you have a keen eye, you can see that there is a gap between the two doors in that um, astragal space. And so that would definitely be an opportunity to seal that space to prevent crawling insects from entering this building. Now the image on the right is an alley door to a restaurant in an urban setting. And obviously this door is in rough shape. It's been exposed to moisture. It's been exposed to salt. And so the door itself is deteriorating. Um, this would need top of the line materials to not only um, make that door more sturdy, but to prevent pests from entering when there's a high pest pressure and pest vulnerability. An important consideration for rodent management is that weatherization is not rodent exclusion. Uh, many times we see people using materials that will, for rodent management, when they have documented rodent pressure, uh, using materials that are used to um, keep the indoor environment from uh, losing efficiency in terms of heat. So weather strips on doors can easily be chewed by rodents, as can expanding foam. Uh, these materials are great at keeping insects out and they're great at maintaining that indoor environment, but rodents can easily overcome them by pushing on them, chewing on them, um, and working together. Several rodents will chew on the same opening if there's a high enough pest pressure. And aesthetics of performed work. If this was my home and someone said they were going to provide pest exclusion and this is what it looked like afterwards, I would be very upset. Um, I have seen several commercial kitchens in New York City where someone performed, quote, pest exclusion and the outcome was unsightly and based on the material selection would be ineffective. So that's a double whammy uh, against that, that company. Now there are some considerations in terms of the material selection based on permeability. And what I mean is that some spaces actually do need to breathe um, to avoid moisture problems. One of those spaces is an attic. So we don't want to convey the message that anytime there's an opening, it needs to be sealed tightly. Because if that was the case in this setting, we might create moisture problems that would not only lead to moisture damage, but also could contribute to other pest problems by creating hum a humid environment conducive to wood boring insects. So we need to understand that these spaces uh, require a different expertise, uh, type of metal screening that will not allow pests to enter, but will allow permeability of that space. Many of you may be uh, familiar with this type of scene on the exterior of a building, and companies will um, close that up, seal it with cement, not understanding that these structures need to breathe as well. Uh, weep holes can be sealed with various different types of screens or um, mesh that is rodent proof, um, and these products will allow water to exude from the building, will limit moisture damage between the exterior facade and interior walls, and also provide pest exclusion. So here's an example of not pest exclusion. Uh, this is what I see in New York City, um, someone basically trying to rebuild a wall with glue boards and then 
shoving some copper mesh into the remaining opening and keeping their fingers crossed that no more pests come through. Um, the, the interesting thing about this image is that the piece of equipment that is present that could prevent pest problems is not in use. And that is, um, if you can see my mouse here, the escutcheon plate, which is pushed all the way against the nozzle here and is not pushed against the wall and sealed effectively. So just because you have materials at your disposal, this does not make them pest exclusion worthy. These are also not pest exclusion. Um, I particularly like the image on the right where someone injected expanding foam into an opening and then used nails from a nail gun to hopefully seal out whatever pest they were dealing with. Um, and the picture on the left is using paper towels to keep out cockroaches from a mechanical room. Um, there are wonderful solutions that we have to keep pests out. Neither of these uh, work. Okay, implementation. The first thing to mention is that sanitation must occur at or during the time we are implementing our exclusion program. This is because we need to treat the problem, the reason that the pests are there, and not just the symptom. So we don't want to just in, um, implement exclusion and expect that that's going to immediately eliminate all our problems we also need to eliminate the conducive conditions for why the pests are there. So in this setting, of course, the food spillage is the real problem and the cockroach that's present is a symptom of that problem. We want to um, record and remove pest evidence as we are implementing our pest exclusion program. This is extremely valuable to verify whether or not our treatment has been effective. If there are rodent droppings everywhere and we perform exclusion and we come back and there are rodent droppings everywhere, how do we know if we've actually excluded them other than testimonials from customers? We need to document through removal of feces and other rodent evidence that we have been effective. Also, this looks great to customers or clients or residents that we have removed um, rodent droppings from their home or environment. There is a link at the bottom of this um, page to um, follow the instructions from the CDC for cleaning up after rodents. Um, there are a number of health risks that can be associated with rodent droppings, urine, um, as we discussed earlier with leptospirosis in New York City, um, so we want to take all the precautions that we can to remove those um, risks as we're cleaning up. So what I'd like to do now is just talk about three different levels of exclusion as we see it um, for implementation. And these different levels are based on the size of the opening. And as a result, it is based on the level of difficulty in implementing exclusion. From my perspective, anybody um, that owns a home, lives in a home, or manages a building has the skills to do this beginner level exclusion. Here we're talking about openings that are less than one inch, and um, there are a number of tools that can be used to seal those openings. We'll talk about metal mesh fibers, elastomeric sealants, and escutcheon plates. The other thing about this uh, beginner level is that it requires very few tools. And so if you are a pest management company and you are hiring technicians or you have uh, management staff, there's not a lot of concern about replacing equipment uh, when it comes to these small openings. So we're dealing with gloves, scissors, some kind of probe to push materials into openings and possibly a brush or vacuum to remove shavings from metal mesh fibers. Uh, we also might use a caulk gun and rags to clean up after the caulk. So metal mesh fibers. Um, as you may know, there are two main types of metal mesh fibers that avail are available um, for pest management. One is uh, copper-based and the other is stainless steel-based. And the stainless steel is the sort of top of the line here because these um, fibers are abrasive for chewing rodents and they do not rust. Um, the copper mesh product is a little, is not as abrasive, 
And um, so it doesn't have that same deterrence as this product. However, uh, as I mentioned earlier, if you're in a situation where the pest pressure is not great, you're looking for a quick temporary fix and to determine if there is pest pressure, you could easily use um, the copper mesh product as a beginning to see if um, you have been successful at excluding that pest. Sealants is another product that can be used for small openings and there are recommendations for selecting and using caulks and sealants in pest management. Uh, this was written by Dr. Bobby Corrigan. This is actually available online um, from the Stop Pests program, but if you um, Google sealants and Corrigan, this article will come up. Uh, this is a very technical document that um, provides information about the different types of products. And um, as you can see the table on the right, it's a bit more scientific. Dr. Corrigan adapted this for a PCT magazine article, which actually includes product suggestions. So you can Google pest proofing small holes and find this article and uh, find specific recommendations for products that are easily available to use in sealing uh, openings one inch or less. Now another tool that many people may not be familiar, familiar with but is easy enough to use are escutcheon plates. Um, these are available in a huge diversity of sizes and shapes and functions from most big box stores, Home Depot, Lowe's, um, or your general hardware stores. And these are used to um, seal the gap where um, some kind of fixture comes through a wall, whether it's electrical, plumbing, gas. Um, we wanna make sure that we select the correct size for the pipe that comes through. And really importantly, that these are sealed to the wall. Um, there's nothing about this product in general that makes it magical. It's just that it creates a nice tight seal around a pipe, but it has to be affixed to the wall, otherwise pests can easily push right through it. So pretty basic stuff. Um, again, I think anybody with any um, handy skills can implement beginner level pest exclusion. Our next level refers um, to openings that are one to four inch in size um, and maybe a little bit more advanced because of the tools that are the tools and supplies that are required. So here we're dealing with hardware cloth and door sweeps and a straggle seals. Our supplies that are a little bit different, um, most importantly, is some kind of drill, whether it's an impact drill to um, fasten to different types of materials. Uh, we'll need fasteners and some skills that involve a level or measuring tape to make sure that we're putting um, these devices on correctly. Hardware cloth. So here we have two different sizes of mesh, um, half inch by half inch squares or quarter inch by quarter inch. The smaller size will exclude mice and the half inch will exclude rats. The gold standard for um, hardware cloth is woven galvanized hardware cloth. Um, in my experience going to um, my local big box stores, I have seen uh, welded hardware cloth and not woven. Woven has that extra strength because fibers are actually interlaced with each other, whereas welded is just they're um, attached to each other in two different planes. So if you're dealing with a severe um, infestation of rats, for example, you may want to search out for that woven galvanized hardware cloth. In this case, um, the fasteners and substrate matter. So we don't wanna just be using staple guns because rats will push and pull and chew and can actually remove staples from some substrates. Uh, we want to use hex head screws with washers to really fasten that material to the, the surface. And we wanna make sure that if we're dealing with rats that we don't allow any edges. If there's even a single um, lift from the uh, material, a rat can grab that with its teeth and pull on it and over time can actually create an opening from that. So we wanna make sure there's no edges or corners. 
Now, a consideration with um, metal mesh and fibers is that, again, buildings and certain structures need to be able to breathe. Um, when we're talking about ventilator grills, unfortunately, um, we have to use half inch mesh. We cannot go smaller to um, prevent smaller organisms from entering these ventilator grills. That's because smaller mesh size can actually uh, reduce the airflow that goes um, between the motor and the exterior areas and can actually lead to burnout and other uh, mechanical issues over time. So we need to select the right material um, that doesn't impede airflow. Door sweeps, okay. As I mentioned, there are two main types of door sweeps um, that are in use today. These are pest proof door sweeps as opposed to the um, weatherization or rubber gasket brush sweeps that are just used to maintain indoor environments. We have our high density brush sweeps that can prevent crawling insects and uh, can prevent mice. But we'll see in a second that a heavy infestation of mice or strong uh, pressure to enter a building can be overcome. Uh, the gold standard for door sweeps is uh, the rubber encased steel fabric. Again, this has the um, galvanized uh, stainless steel metal inside that's sharp fibers. Even if rodents chew through this uh, rubber encasing, um, they're met with the uh, metal mesh fiber that is highly irritating to their gums. So this can prevent insects and rodents. Here's the consideration when it comes to brush sweeps is that they can fail under high pressure. Uh, the top image comes from a bakery in the metropolitan New York area. This is an exterior door and you can see that over time, mice have actually chewed through the corner of that brush sweep and have gained access. Um, that brown smudge under that space demonstrates that there's a high pressure here. That they've been using this entry point for a while um, as is also indicated by the number of droppings. Um, the bottom image is actually from a school, and um, we saw several doors that had the same chewing in the corner. Um, rodents are feeling protected in that corner. They have contact with two sides, and so they can uh, be protected, chew away at that opening, and then enter the school. So brush sweeps can fail under high rodent pressure. Some other considerations is that just because you select the right material, doesn't mean that it's automatically going to work. We need to make sure that it's installed correctly um, and following manu manufacturer recommendations for how to implement these uh, materials. There's a number of um, applications of these materials that are available. So depending on what type of door you have, um, if it's a single door, double door, uh, garage compression door, loading dock door, uh, there are different materials that are available. And then moving on to our last level of exclusion, advanced exclusion. Um, this is for openings that are four inches or larger, um, dealing with soffits, roofs, chimneys. And oftentimes this is left to a crew that is designated as an exclusion crew with some construction expertise. Um, maybe it's some masonry expertise, knowing what tools are used and supplies for that trade, sheet metal or carpentry. And I'll just go back to a second here and say for soffits and roofs, um, the reason that I consider this advanced level exclusion is because the, the need for use of ladders and training for ladder safety. So there are a number of issues that can occur with um, concrete hollow block. For example, if it's not installed correctly, there could be gaps between the block. Um, hopefully many of you have not experienced this, but over time in uh, damp conditions, some of that mortar between blocks can deteriorate and allow for pest entry. Um, there are solutions for on top of concrete hollow blocks. I don't know what the use has been like for pest management professionals, but these um, pest proof materials are available to seal the tops of concrete hollow block. Galvanized sheet metal can be used um, to patch holes on the exterior. Um, fastening it to brick, as in the case on the right. Um, when, when selecting these materials, we, we need to know what gauge of material to use. All of these specifications are found in pest prevention by design. 
Again, um, that is available on the SCOPE website, but also by Googling pest prevention by design. As I mentioned, there are considerations for using sheet metal, knowing how to bend metal, and selecting the right thickness. So all of this um, is advanced because even for me, this is beyond my expertise. I'm not out there bending sheet metal to perform exclusion. So um, this may require a little bit more understanding of the trade to implement it correctly. Now some of the special um, situations that may occur is foundation barriers and burrowing rodents. Um, this is particularly important in areas where there's Norway rats. They will um, burrow under the exterior of a building and find their way into dirt, dirt floor crawl spaces as pictured in these images. And there are solutions to excluding them from those zones. Um, one that is not an exclusion technique in that it's 100% effective, but more of a deterrence is the use of vegetation free zones. Uh, these use uh, one inch diameter stone of some kind of crushed stone on the perimeter about two feet wide out from the building and six inches deep. Now, um, implementing this is not challenging at all. It just requires the time and some manual labor to implement this type of uh, vegetation free zone. So I think this is um, something that's easily completed, whether it's around a building or we'll talk about tree pits in a moment for urban areas um, and stone can also be used in those areas. Um, a more effective but requiring more technique or more expertise is the use of curtain walls. Uh, these can be cement or metal, and this image demonstrates the dimensions that would be required for a curtain wall to prevent rats from getting into a building. Um, this is basically a three foot deep um, piece of metal that goes into the soil and then a foot out from the foundation. And again, um, if rodents were really determined, they could dig below this, but in most cases, um, they're not gonna be going more than a foot and a half down. And so this um, technique can be used to prevent rodents on the exterior of buildings as well. Something that could be used temporarily um, that would have to be replaced in time, but um, the use of hardware cloth, galvanized because we don't want it to rust, um, we can make a curtain wall out of hardware cloth on the exterior of buildings as well. Um, this has been used particularly in um, rural areas when we're dealing with uh, chicken coop or other type of um, facility that has food inside. Um, and this is based on uh, one of the resources that you'll find on the SCOPE website. Uh, for tree pits, as I mentioned, uh, crushed stone has been shown to deter rats from burrowing in those. There's also um, a product made of this stainless steel mesh that can be used to underlay soil that rodents cannot burrow through. So this has been used um, in some areas in New York City, uh, but can be expensive uh, for some operations. Now, one of the considerations that is often overlooked for uh, commercial areas or um, basements or utility rooms is the type of floor drain cap that is being used. Um, obviously, if you look at these two different caps, you could see that one has much smaller openings. The one on the left would prevent uh, American cockroach adults from entering from the drain, um, whereas the one on the right would easily allow roaches to enter. Unfortunately, sometimes the water use in that building will deter um, management professionals from selecting the one on the left. If there's a high volume of water that's constantly going into drains, it may need to have uh, larger openings that allow more water to enter at a given time. Um, but for some, for some options, it could be um, use the one on the left to prevent American cockroaches from entering the building. And of course, we can't forget um, on our exterior inspection to look for those bridges that allow pests to enter in areas that we may not identify when just looking at ground level. Um, 
vegetation such as vines that are growing from the ground up towards vents, such as the picture on the right, could easily provide a bridge for mice to enter a building, um, especially since the grates, as we mentioned, um, inside those vents are half inch wide, would easily allow a mouse to enter. The image on the left um, demonstrates that tree branches in contact with the roof could provide an opportunity for rats, uh, both roof rats and Norway rats, uh, as well as squirrels and other um, types of uh, larger mammals to enter through the roof. And the last um, exclusion opportunity I want to point out is human behavior. Human behavior will always trump any exclusion effort that you make. Um, whether it's a torn screen that we just haven't got around to fixing, or if there's a door that just won't close, um, pests will exploit those opportunities. And unless we put forth the effort to make sure that those openings are not readily accessible, um, we may be dealing with a pest problem based on human behavior. So we'll move on to quickly evaluate our program. Um, this is more of a step if you are the one that is funding exclusion or performing the exclusion yourself, you want to know that the effort that you undertook or you paid for was effective. So you want to record what you did and where. Um, if you have seen fewer pests, if you've seen no pests, and what do you need to do in the future? Now this um, relates more for uh, any pest professionals. And early on, I saw that there was only one in the audience. Um, but one of the arguments that we often hear is that we don't do pest exclusion because it's not lucrative for us. Um, many of the arguments are that once I perform pest exclusion, then I'll lose business. I won't have anything else to do. And that's really not the case because pest exclusion is not a one-time service. It is a routine service. There needs to be some annual inspection to identify if there's any new entry points based on building movement or deterioration of materials. Um, and so we recommend at least two times per year doing an assessment, one in the spring to look at winter damage and one in the fall to verify that there's no entry points for pests. Um, this can be performed in-house if you are a multifamily housing or um, even a homeowner, just to make sure that your own structure is, is safe. It's an opportunity to uh, identify new entry points, to repair and replace any materials that may have succumbed to damage, and um, an opportunity to put monitors in places indoors to verify that these programs are effective. Now I know this is a, a busy list here, but in my opinion, these are the 13 steps to really and thoroughly implementing a pest exclusion program. Uh, communication, identifying several steps to identify the openings, um, recording what the problems are, implementing that pest exclusion program and evaluating it. So um, I did mention that on uh, the Stop Pests website that Susanna provided, there is a link to the SCOPE website. Um, I did wanna offer another way to get there, which is directly through um, the New York State IPM programs website. So here's some really basic instructions, but start with nysipm.cornell.edu, um, select the community tab and go down to homes and other buildings. And then there's a link on the left that says Scientific Coalition on Pest Exclusion. And once you're there, uh, we have some brief description of, of what the Scientific Coalition is all about. Um, we have a list of our core members and our working group members. And then on the right is really where all the information that you need on pest exclusion can be found. We have a number of general resources, uh, material, material selections, tool selection, uh, conducive conditions, and our inspection forms that I mentioned earlier. And with that, um, that's the end of my talk for today. As Susanna indicated, um, you can contact me. My email address is here. 
Uh, you can also follow me on Twitter or find the New York State IPM program on our various social media platforms such as Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and Flickr. Thank you all for your time. Thank you, Matt. I learned so much. I have a couple questions, actually, I'm going to get to, um, but I want to remind folks that uh, at this time to um, type in your questions in the chat box and the Q&A, and I will get to them. Um, I'm going to put up our, our links again. Um, sorry. Uh, that's the Stop Pest email and Matt Fry's email and the New York State IPM website again. Uh, let us know if you have questions after the webinar, need more training materials. Uh, the, the SCOPE website um, is connected now to the, to the Stop Pest website. And uh, just let us know if you need training on site, Stop Pest comes on site, does a site evaluation for affordable housing providers and uh, staff and resident training, uh, but we can also just be available to ask, answer questions too. Um, well, I'll start with, as I wait for folks to type in their questions, um, a couple things that I'm, I'm curious about. Um, well, one is when you talked about the difference between a uh, house mouse and the field mice or the deer mice, um, even though in the fall the field mice and the deer mice are trying to come into your home and they are more seasonal, they can establish um, they can establish a population inside a home. Is that correct? Yes, that is correct. Um, so, I mean, it is a textbook case that they are coming in in the fall, staying through the winter, and then leaving in the spring. But they can absolutely spend their entire life cycle nesting in your home. Um, and so, yeah, there it it's kind of a indicator that there's a exclusion opportunity on the exterior, but right, they can, okay. they can survive all year round inside a home. Gotcha, okay. And then the other question I had was um, uh, something you mentioned that, that stuck with me was um, when I had done a building evaluation with Bobby Corrigan, he was explaining for this particular building, there was a mouse problem with the mice were um, reproducing and there was a good population that was already in the in the building um, and in people's residences and he advised that they do the ceiling first work their way outside to inside but you said with rats it can be different so um, is that correct so if it's a mouse issue you can start by doing the exterior exclusion first to keep any new mice out and then work on your interior population. But with rats, you wanna make sure you are taking care of the interior population because they will try to get outside. That is a great question. Um, yeah, so my, my experience has been with rats and what I've experienced is that if you seal rats inside, they go crazy and they can create new openings and change their patterns. Um, so right, you want to make sure that you've reduced the population before you do that exterior exclusion. But I would agree with Bobby, of course, that if you're dealing with mice and specifically house mice, um, that you would wanna prevent um, new mice from coming in and then conduct your trapping because um, mice are probably not as destructive um, as the rats are gonna be. And so you can um, hopefully prevent that new introduction and reduce the population, I would say at the same time. Okay, thank you. Um, I have an easy one that I can answer. Bethany asked, will this presentation be posted online? Yes, I'll edit the, the recording and post it online within a week. Um, now let's look for more questions for Matt. Oh, so one of the first questions that came up was when you were talking about the different types of cockroaches, one of the um, attendees asked if, if we've dealt with Turkestan cockroaches in and around buildings. And I have not, they are, I think they're, they're more of a pest of the Southwest, but possibly New York City too. Matt, do you have any experience with them? I unfortunately do not have any experience with Turkestan cockroaches. Oh, so if some of my colleagues from Arizona uh, or the Southwest are online, maybe uh, 
write in the chat box if you have experience with them. I know that they are mainly an exterior or a, um, yeah, an outside pest, but they can come in. So I think there would probably be, be a good reason to do some uh, exclusion if you have uh, Turkestan cockroaches. And that's a new cockroach that has just come into the country, I'd say. Well, probably in the, for 20 or 30 years, it's been here, but we're just starting to hear about it more. Hmm. Um, okay, and let's see. Under what conditions, if any, is spraying necessary? I'm assuming for cockroaches. I'll let you handle that one, Matt, while I review the other questions. Sure. So um, I am not advocating um, not using pesticides in managing pests. Um, I certainly understand that there's a role for that. And when dealing with cockroaches, um, I would definitely suggest reducing the population with um, some kind of traditional management. We can use um, glue boards to sort of slow down reproduction and, and catch some of those individuals. But um, the baits and the um, sprays, as you'll say, um, can be used to reduce the population. So I think uh, some of the research that we're seeing from Dr. Dini Miller is suggesting that the biggest challenge in cockroach management is that we're not um, identifying the population size before we attempt our management efforts. So monitoring first to document what the size is and then using the appropriate amount of bait for cockroach management um, has been shown to be really effective even in severe infestations in Virginia. So um, I think reviewing some of her work to um, understand their baiting techniques and to understand how they're monitoring to document population size is a great place to start. Yeah, that leads me to another question that I see from Marlon. Um, I'm gonna uh, go to the second part of your question first, and that is, in your opinion, can IPM be successful without resident tenant involvement? Um, uh, yeah. What Matt said was, the best evidence we have that it can be successful um, is Dini Miller's research. It is always more helpful and more successful with tenant and resident involvement, but Dr. Dini Miller at uh, Virginia Tech has found even without resident cooperation, a lot of bait applied, the correct amount of bait for your population can um, reduce that population to either eliminate it or get it down to, um, you know, at least 90% eliminated. So even without resident and tenant involvement, we should not use that as an excuse for not controlling or not getting control over the pests. It is more of a matter of uh, applying enough bait, even in unsanitary homes. Matt, do you have anything you would add to that? Certainly for uh, cockroach management, I would agree, uh, based on the research for rodent management, I oh, think, yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's a little bit different where, you know, we're not going to manage the rodent population unless we first implement sanitation. And so um, there is, there is that need for um, cooperation um, because rodents, if, if we don't have exclusion um, in place, rodents can move between units. And so one person's um, lack of involvement could affect others. So yeah, there, I, I wish there was um, similar results at, with rodents as with cockroaches, but unfortunately I think um, we do need resident involvement if there's a, a rodent infestation. And the Stop Pest website has some resources. We have a page on working with residents if um, you need uh, more assistance or some, some ideas on how to um, work with residents, um, we have a page on our website. And the first part of Marlon's question was, I work for a large housing, housing agency. We need to convert from conventional pest control practices to IPM. What are some of the preliminary first steps we should take as part of that transition? Please talk to me offline. Well, let's communicate by email. Um, I, I will take a first stab. Um, we always start with the contract, changing the contract. If you have a contractor, um, developing a policy, uh, training staff, doing resident education, um, 
you know, there's several more steps, but uh, this is a very long and drawn out process and each building it looks a little bit different for. So um, I would encourage you to check out the Stop Pest website for some resources on how to transition, but also to talk to us. And Matt, do you have a, any words of wisdom on, on that? That's kind of a big question, I know. Yeah, I would say that you are the expert in that realm and that, um, you know, they should first speak with you. I, I think it does come down to the contracting because what we've seen a lot of times is not having the right RFP or contract in place is what um, allows the, the wrong kind of pest control to be in place. The other key parts we, you hit on were um, monitoring and record keeping. We don't know if we're getting good pest control unless some monitoring and record keeping is happening and communication with all parties. It's, um, everyone plays a role. So we can talk more about that um, if you contact me individually. Now another specific exclusion question is what type of caulk works best in sealing out mice? Good question. Okay, so um, one of the resources that I point to is um, Dr. Corrigan's article, Pest Proofing Small Holes. And in that is a nice discussion on the difference between caulks and sealants. Um, the reason that um, we, well, Dr. Corrigan makes this distinction is that caulks um, tend to dry and pull away from surfaces. And so even though they feel hard, they are not maintaining a tight seal between the two, um, the two parts of the opening. So we wanna select a sealant um, that will be pest proof for uh, more than just rodents, but also for insect pests. Um, the sealants are more flexible, and so as the building moves, they move as well. Um, I would recommend going to um, that article for the specific recommendations, but there are some high quality sealants that can be used to start for um, rodent management. Dr. Corrigan lists um, NP1, GeoCell, and uh, Rust-Oleum's industrial grade sealant compound. Um, if you're dealing with an active mouse infestation and they're chewing through other materials, then a sealant isn't the best option. Um, in that case, you either want to plug the hole with um, one of the metal mesh fibers or do a repair job to actually seal the hole with a more permanent material that will prevent um, chewing pests. Oh, and that just um, triggered a thought on my part. I will put the links to the company excluder on the homepage for this webinar. Um, but Matt, if you can think of another company that sells um, exclusion materials specifically, uh, let me know and we'll put some links up on the, um, the uh, homepage for this webinar. Sure. Um, oh, hi, Lori. Uh, Lori is asking, what's your experience working with construction sites near housing causing Norway rat problems? Oh boy. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, <laughs> I actually don't have um, any direct experience with that. Um, so I, you know, I understand that with construction sites, there's obviously a lot of disturbance and that can lead to um, rodent pressure on surrounding buildings. It would seem in those cases that the really important um, thing to do is to identify those obvious exterior entry points and uh, use the sort of maybe the gold standard for um, keeping pests out there. So relying on those excluder products um, if, you if you're dealing with doors and other openings. Um, you know, I think having a exterior um, management program might be helpful in that situation, but um, it's more useful to monitor on the exterior of the building to, to understand the pest pressure um, before doing any kind of um, heavy treatment right off the bat. So you can, you know, what, what I've seen used in the past is um, bait stations with DTEX, which is a type of monitoring block, and then snap traps inside um, those devices. So that'll give you an indication of how much bait is being removed and how much pressure is there and what target pest you're dealing with if it is definitely Norway rats seems like construction sites cause like um, 
you know, exacerbate any, if there is a rat problem, having that construction site nearby definitely is going to exacerbate and, and you're going to get higher pressure. Um, Laura, you probably have already, you're probably already doing this, but working with the city uh, public works or whoever uh, the department in, in the city where you're in um, does the uh, rodent control and having them aware that there needs to be heavier baiting in that area um, because it's tough when it's not on the properties that you're managing. Um, that has to be, uh, you know, it's nothing that you can do on your on your particular property except to do the exclusion. Yeah, and you know, even if you've done exclusion prior to the work, um, it's possible that construction could affect um, your building too. So it could affect um, soil nearby. And so you, you wanna continuously inspect to make sure that there's no new openings um, that would allow pests to enter. Oh, and Lori replied, we are, ISD rodent control has been helpful. Yeah, that's a, a challenge in and of itself to have the construction nearby. Um, Marlon has a, another question. I'm not sure I understand it, but let me read it out loud and, and we can um, puzzle through it. Generally speaking, are there any standard treatment measures for roaches which counteract common or standard treatment measures for mice and rats? Hmm. Like do, do rodents eat roach bait? I can't think of any. Matt, is that something you can think of? Um, I mean, for so if this is dealing with housing, I, I really wouldn't think so. I mean, one of the concerns that we do have sometimes is uh, what bait is used on a rodent trap. Um, because in some cases, if, if people use um, a food bait, that could be attractive mm -hmm. to cockroaches as well as ants and other pests. Um, so one of the recommendations is to use a non-food bait, such as um, nesting material can be used, especially for mice. Um, sometimes people use dental floss that's been dipped in some kind of vanilla extract or something else to make it smell uh, like a food source, but then it's actually a nesting material and which is attractive to the rodents. So tying that onto a bait can, can or a snap trap can be used um, to attract rodents. Um, we don't recommend, you know, the standard that people use is peanut butter, but there's often a lot of concern about peanut allergies. And so um, rodent baiting is, a, is probably a whole nother um, presentation in terms of where to place traps and what materials to select. But basically we want to complement the current food source that they're using. Um, whatever they're currently feeding on in that environment, that's the best bait to use on the traps. Um, so, you know, again, considering um, cockroaches will feed on, on some of those baits, um, maybe moving to those nesting materials. If in other environments, um, one thing to consider is how floors are washed. Um, in commercial kitchens, for example, if um, sprays are being used for cockroach management, but floors are washed regularly with bleach or another solution that will taint baits and sprays um, and make them unattractive to cockroaches. So those kinds of considerations are also um, true. Um, oh, Joellen, I see you shared a link. I will check it out and share it on the homepage of the, the webinar page if, um, uh, if that's what you're sharing it for. Let's see. Another myth I hear is that roaches and mice won't exist in the same apartment. That is not true. <laughs> <laughs> One thing I just wanted to mention really quickly about, we didn't talk about bed bugs, but there has been incidences where I've seen exclusion efforts really make a difference in bed bug uh, control. But I wouldn't say there's like a standard practice for exclusion for bed bugs, but it's more about inspection and figuring out the patterns of dispersal. In one building I worked in, 
I was doing a resident program and all the residents kept telling me they were finding bed bugs in their bathtubs. And that is a very unusual place to find bed bugs. And with that clue, the staff realized that they were going from mainly from one apartment they spread where they weren't able to control it uh, because of a hoarding situation. But from that apartment, they would go through the, um, there was a space along the bathroom vents that they were traveling through and they were dropping into bathtubs. Now the maintenance staff sealed those all up and they were really able to isolate the, the infestations to that one apartment. They did several other things, but that was a really key piece in understanding how they were spreading. Another building I worked in, same story, they had about a 20% infestation rate in, in a high rise and they found they were going along the heating pipes, which is a nice warm place for them to be attracted to. They took their maintenance guys offline for, you know, as long as it took, they sealed around with the proper sealing material. Um, they sealed around the heating pipes and then again, they were, it, without changing their protocols very much. They added, they did a few extra things, but um, they didn't change a tremendous amount in their, in their control protocols. And they were able to isolate the infestations to just a couple of apartments by figuring out where they were spreading, how they were spreading and how they were going from apartment to apartment. So it might not be necessary in every case, but uh, bed bug management, like all these pests takes that, inspection and, and a little bit of detective work, I think, to know. I did want to add to that, and I, I should probably include a few slides on this, but one of our colleagues at Harvard, um, Richard Pollack, has done a lot of work with fire stopping, and um, he's been actually able to leverage funds for you know, fire stopping, uh, which is also effective as pest exclusion. And so they use different types of materials to plug all holes that go between rooms that could potentially allow fire to jump from room to room on campus in Harvard. And um, what they've noticed is that, you know, that will, those materials also prevent mice from moving, they could prevent bed bugs, and it basically makes every single unit a compartmentalized unit. So that's one thing to investigate. There, there may be funds available for fire stopping that could, as a added bonus, um, prevent pests from moving as well. Yeah, and um, third case of bed, uh, with bed bugs that just occurred to me, and I think it happens quite frequently, I've seen it in other people's work, is um, under doorways going across the hall from apartments they just scatter all over so having door sweeps installed and some buildings are able to do that and I've have encountered um, certain buildings that they cannot put in door sweeps um, due to fire risks I think so it's important to know what the <laughs> what uh, your specific um, requirements are in your building but door sweeps uh, for bed bugs have been an effective way to keep them from traveling through hallways um, I don't see any other questions, so I will let you guys all go, let Matt go, and thank you very much for your time. I'm just going to show my last slide so you can see the homepage of our of the Stop Pest website and all the resources we have there, and our short link to the page where these resources and the recording of the webinar will be housed is stoppest.org slash go slash exclusion, or you can get there by just hitting the webinars button at the top of the page. So thank you everyone for joining us today, and uh, we appreciate you participating in the polls and hanging in there for almost two hours. And thank you so much, Matt and get in touch with us if you need help. Thanks everybody, have a great day.